have just Fran and you come in here to do some surgery and the port <laughs> right to the tomb. I see Fran there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot lend us your hand. You, you need to be here. To <laughs> hey, Josh, can I share this? Am I able to, uh, I can share the screen. Did you give me the capacity to do that? Yeah, you just use the yeah. button in the middle. So, let me just yeah. see if... Uh, for our principal, you know what, he's a white, we have some uh, um, uh, housekeeping announcement. Oh yeah, go ahead, please. And before we move ahead. I think it's about time. For, for those of you who are here, I'm going to speak alternatively in English and French before we, we give the flow to Professor uh, 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 Mark Kamon. So actually this idea came from Ivy Umet and we discussed with them the idea of having visiting professor. Visiting professor will allow an expert in a field to come and give a lecture and virtually because we are in different countries to allow us to discuss on a different different topics on a regular basis. So we agreed on that and last year we signed an MAU between Ivy Umet and Causa to allow this to happen. So far we haven't started and today at the request of Dr. Kurt McCommon, uh, we decided to start it. And I would like to mention that Dr. Kurt McCommon is an associate member of PAUSA, is a, a good standing member in good standing of PAUSA. So it's a really a good thing that a member of PAUSA uh, have the, has the idea of uh, put, uh, putting us together to try to discuss topics that are important to us. So, uh, I will let him introduce himself more in a, in, in a moment. And before we start, we'll ask everybody to mute his, himself so that we, 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 uh, we, we avoid noises from our environment. And uh, we can also do that via Josh who can meet everybody. And, and then uh, when, when there are questions, ask him to speak. You can send text questions. We try to club them, to put them together and identified uh, some uh, key question, burning question, that uh, if time allows, we look to help we'll uh, answer later. So this is going to be the first session, but we'll welcome anyone who have a talk to give. I know we'll have colleagues from the US, but also there will be some talk from uh, uh, African, from PAUSA member within Africa, who will also give some talk. And, uh, and we thought it would be a good opportunity in this area era of uh, COVID-19 where activities are reduced in most areas. So this is in summary what I would like to say. But in French, donc, uh, cette session, c'est une session qui est le fruit d'une réflexion entre uh, Ivy Met avec uh, son président, Dr. Kurt McCammon, qui nous avait approché, qui avait suggéré l'idée de faire des visiting professors qui permettraient uh, virtuellement de faire des conférences qui permettront de, de, de s'adresser à des, à, des, à des sujets qui nous intéressent tous et uh, particulièrement en cette période de COVID-19 où les activités sont réduites, où il est difficile de voyager, assister à des congrès. Nous avons pensé que ça allait être une bonne opportunité d'engager de, de, cette, cette discussion. Donc, Kurt McCammon, pour vous, pour vous l'introduire, il va se présenter encore davantage tout à l'heure, est un membre à part entière de la PAUSA. Et c'est pour cela que c'est assez intéressant que des membres de la PAUSA aient cette initiative qui certainement va marquer un tournant dans l'avenir de nos communications scientifiques. 
Donc, après cette première présentation d'aujourd'hui, nous n'allons pas nous arrêter. Nous encourageons euh, d'autres virologues, que ce soit des États-Unis, d'Europe, mais surtout d'Afrique, à proposer des thèmes qui nous permettront de discuter autour des de sujets qui vont nous intéresser. Donc, nous allons demander à chacun de, de muter, euh, de, 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 de le micro pour éviter des interférences de voix. Nous encourageons également, s'il y a des questions, à les poser soit par texto, à les envoyer par texto, on va essayer de les regrouper. Et après la présentation, on aura quelques minutes de discussion. Voilà un peu ce qu'on pouvait dire avant de passer la parole à Dr. Kurt Dr. Kurt, you have the floor. Thank you, Mohamed. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to share my slides with everybody and, and please make sure that you can, everybody can see them. Um, and then I think as Mohammed mentioned, if people can mute themselves, that might make it easier for, um, for everybody to hear. Um, but, it, but if you have questions, please just uh, type in or, you know, I think there's a place to raise your hand. So it's truly, a, um, I think it's, I think this is a, a wonderful way for us to start communicating, hopefully. Um, it's an honor for me. It's an honor for me to be a member of Positive to allow you to be in in your society, and hopefully, um, hopefully we can uh, all get back together sometime in the near future and see each other once we're through the, our current situation. So, um, what we talked about was doing uh, decision making in urethral reconstruction and maybe some other some of the difficult cases for people who know me. I always show pictures of where we are. So uh, we live in uh, Norfolk, the state of Virginia. It's far away from New York. I used to always say it was far away from Washington, D.C., but it's also far away from New York, which is, uh, which is good right now. But we, we're down in the, the southeast corner of Virginia. Um, I was excited that the uh, AUA was going to be in Washington this year because I was hoping a lot of friends would come visit, but obviously that's canceled. But here are some pictures from our inner harbor. A lot of history, not like you may have on your continent, but we have uh, the American Revolution was uh, finished or ended in our area. That's our downtown, and this is some beaches that we have. This is the hospitals um, and medical school that I work at. So when we're all through all this and we can start, we would love to have people come and visit and see us, and I look forward to coming there. So <clears throat> let's just jump right into it. You know, it's when I, when I see a patient with a stricture, there's a number of things that cross my mind and that I need to consider. One is obviously the etiology. What's the, is it traumatic? Because a traumatic stricture is gonna be treated different than an infectious stricture, lichen sclerosis. So here's a gentleman who has a traumatic stricture. It's an anterior stricture, so that's another thing we need to concern about the location. Is it anterior or posterior? What about maybe an infectious stricture or a patient with lichen sclerosis? our treatment options are gonna be so different for these patients. The other thing that you think about is what's the length? You know, if it's a short traumatic stricture, you can excise the scar, put the urethra back together, and those patients are gonna do great. If the stricture is a little bit longer, well, then you may need to do some tissue um, interposition. What about the caliber? If it's very tight, yeah, obviously that's gonna be a different, if it's a tight, long stricture, we'll discuss. And then obviously, did they have previous treatments? Have they had radiation? In the United States, we're seeing so many more strictures who have had radiation recently. This is obviously a posterior stricture, so obviously it's managed differently than a lot of our anterior strictures. I think the other thing, when I first started thinking about putting together this talk, it's, it was to decide, maybe not just think about what we think about in the United States, but outside. So obviously there are characteristics of our, our patients that we need to address. Can they take time off work? Some of our patients can't afford surgery. Um, maybe they want an incision and, or endoscopic procedure, not a big surgery. Again, some of your patients, some of our patients cannot afford this. And especially in the near future, it'll be harder. Are they worried about their erectile function? That is a risk with a um, urethral reconstruction. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. And again, the recovery, their long-term outcomes. It's important that the patients make their choice but it's important that you inform them of all their options as well. So treatment options, just like in real estate, depends on location. So obviously the treatment of this stricture will be different than this one and will for sure be different than this stricture. 
So all of our treatments are gonna be different depending on the location, the caliber, the length, and then we need to have a good understanding of, of the length um, or of the urethra. So just to, everybody knows this, but obviously there are different areas of the urethra. We're gonna mostly talk about anterior strictures, which go all the way back to the membranous urethra. Um, we could do posterior urethral strictures at another time, but we're most gonna be talking about fossa, penile, and bulbar strictures today. And our goals, um, it's always important that we understand what our goals are. Our goals for reconstruction are to restore normal voiding, unobstructed and maintain normal sexual function. Because when our patients leave, I hope all of our patients in Norfolk void like this, but I also hope all of your patients do the same. I think this is a great definition. This was um, in a paper on uh, female urethral strictures. And that's why they talk about um, differentiation from dysfunctional voiding. But uh, the definition is a fixed anato anatomic narrowing of the urethra such that the lumen will not accommodate instrumentation without disruption of the mucosa. I think that's a really nice definition of, of what a stricture truly is. All right. So I think the area that I see issues with the most, not only not outside the US, but even in the United States, is we do not evaluate our patients well. And I talked about doing a study um, with you all, and hopefully we can start that up once we're through here. But when we were at Pausa last year, we talked about doing a study about doing retrograde urethrograms. So our patients need a good retrograde urethrogram. And what that entails is you need to see the whole urethra from the meatus, from, you know, from the fossa navicularis and the meatus, all the way back, including the prostatic urethra and bladder neck. We would then do a VCUG. So how I do, this is an artist that drew on how we do our retrogrades. We have a catheter and I do all mine myself. I understand that's not possible for all of you, but I do all my retrogrades myself. And I inject contrast and I fill the bladder and then they will void afterwards. So not only do I get a, a x-ray of the urine going in, but also of the urine coming out. The cystoscopy is sometimes necessary. If you look at the AUA guidelines, it says it is necessary, but in all honesty, there are times where it doesn't change my plan, and so I don't always do it. But this was a gentleman who had radiation, and I thought it was important to evaluate his urethra. And then people have described using ultrasound. But that's actually, it's quite difficult to do. It's also expensive, and it's not something that we do frequently here in, in Norfolk. So this is the thing I really want to um, stress. So learning, doing a good retrograde urethrogram. So as I was saying, I would love to start a, a study looking at your retrogrades, and I'll show you some pictures of ones I've seen when I've traveled, and, and actually do a study looking at your x-rays, and then actually going and talking to your radiologist and see if we could actually teach them how to do the x-rays better, and then maybe we could actually get no, better x-rays like for our patients. So a patient needs to be placed in the lateral position, 45 degree, um, you want to see one obturator fully and a, a, just part of another one. The penis should be unstretched. And then when we inject the contrast, you see this is labeled as bad because we don't see the contrast throughout the whole urethra. It's not in the prostatic urethra or the bladder. This is a better x-ray because you can see contrast all the way through. So you do need to make sure you, you inject gently because if you inject too fast, It'll actually cause a lot of pain. And I'm not sure who's talking, but if they could um, mute their computer, that would be awesome. Um, just for everybody else. It is now. So here is obviously where the sphincter is, and then your prostatic urethra. Ah, I think Josh muted all of you. So sorry, or actually good. <laughs> and I'm, I guess you can hear me now because he unmuted me, but I think the rest of you are muted. Um, so here's actually some pictures of x-rays that I was asked to operate on when um, this gentleman was in Zimbabwe this last year. I think this was somebody in, in uh, Kenya a number of years ago. And here are some more. And you can see, you really don't know what we're doing. I mean, we, we don't know where the stricture is, the full extent of the stricture, how bad things will be. And, and I would argue that if you take somebody to the operating room to do a partial nephrectomy, you're gonna come in with at least a CT scan to look at what you're dealing with. Well, you should do the same with urethral strictures. We should understand exactly 
exactly what we're doing. Again, here's another picture. So this actually is from, from Zimbabwe. They measured the distance, as you can see here, it's 3.4 centimeters. Well, when we got the patient in the operating room, you can tell that this is gonna be a lot longer. It was actually 10 centimeters. This is his penoscleral junction, and this is a membranous urethral stricture. So there was no way to repair this gentleman. He had failed two or three. So again, if we'd have had the adequate x-ray, we would have known what to do as we were getting, you know, preparing the patient to go to the operating room. So the other thing I, I find very important is have an honest conversation with your patient. It's okay if the patient chooses to have an internal urethrotomy, and we're going to talk about those in a second, it's completely fine as long as they understand the chances of success rates with it. So I, every one of my patients, I talk about managing their stricture, and I talk about curing their stricture. And I leave that up to them for them to decide what they actually want. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So when we look at um, results on doing urethrotomies, this was probably one of the first papers, one of the bigger papers uh, published by Dr. Pansadora. And if you look at his success rates down here, success rates are actually very poor. Iatrogenic success rates are 42%. Infection, less than 50. Um, traumatic, 16%, and that's probably not even true because they didn't follow the patients very long. Um, congenital, only two patients, 66. So as you can see, the success rates are actually very poor with urethrotomies. If we then look at the success rates, depending on the caliber of stricture, if it's less than 15 French, success rates are, are 34%. If it's, and these are bulbar, if it's outside the bulbar urethra, the success rates are even lower. If it's more than 15 French, which I could almost argue that I wouldn't even do a urethrotomy, the success rates are only 70%. But unfortunately, that's the number that most patients are quoted. Most patients I talk to are quoted, they have a 70% chance of this working for them, when truly they do not. Um, again, length, if it's, more, if it's less than a centimeter, then it's probably semi-reasonable to try a urethrotomy. But if it's more, then it's not. So we don't even do urethrotomies unless I do, I have a um, retrograde urethrogram that identifies the length. Because I want to be able to tell the patient honestly his success rates. If it's, if it's going to be too, greater than two centimeters and it's 20%, he should understand that. And then obviously if it's a recurrence, recurrence strictures rarely respond. Um, if it's been, had a urethrotomy once, doing it again, it's almost a, always a 0% chance. Um, and these are just the number of cases. Again, success rates are very poor in this group. So this was a paper, um, I'm sorry, this should have been, this was a paper by Dr. Um, Barbagli. And he, what he did was, he actually broke different variables. So he actually looked at flow rates, he looked at length of stricture, and he looked at um, caliber, and he came up with his algorithm to treat these patients. And this is actually a very good study. He broke the flow down into less than five, five to eight, or greater than eight. He broke the length down into one to two, two to three, or three to four. And as you can see, success rates drop for each one. Um, and in their conclusion, if your flow rate is less than eight centimeters, or less than, uh, than five um, cc's per second, the chance of the internal urethrotomy working is almost zero. If the stricture is greater than two centimeters, you should not be doing a urethrotomy. So the only people you should be doing a urethrotomy on are strictures less than two centimeters with a flow greater than eight. Again, most of the time we don't know this data when we get to the operating room. Um, and so again, it's important to do. I do understand that flow rates may be difficult, um, but a lot of places will have a, a flow ability to do flow rate. So when we, again, when we think about, all right, what are we gonna offer our patients? If we have a short stricture, um, I think it's reasonable to offer urethrotomy if it's a non-traumatic stricture. If it's greater than two to three centimeters, I, I think the success rates are poor and we do not offer that to those patients unless they chose to do it knowing that it's gonna fail and they're gonna need another operation. Please, lichen sclerosis, it doesn't work. Recurrent strictures, it doesn't work. Penile urethra, success rates are very poor. And then fractures. Any type of traumatic injury where you have a straddle injury or a um, pelvic fracture urethral injury, success rates are very poor. So in those groups, I would suggest not even doing it and going on to a definitive repair. Because 
again, this is how we would try to cure them. A DVIU if it's a short stricture or open reconstruction, and then we need to decide primary anastomosis versus tissue substitution. So let's um, look at the options, like single or staged. Sometimes we do have to do staged still. Um, tissue transfer and EPA. Well, are we gonna do a vessel sparing um, or not? Do we need a flap or a graft? And then if we're gonna do a graft, what type of graft can we use? Mostly we're gonna use buckle, but if the patient's had a lot of buccal grafts, you could use their tongue. You could use postericular. People are now describing uh, rectal, Bladder has not done very well, and we've done some tissue engineering that hopefully we'll be um, starting to do some uh, human trials in the near future. Flaps are becoming less common, but still done. So penile islands or scrotal skin flaps, and then an augmented um, perineal urethrostomy is a, a procedure that we should never forget, because sometimes we do need to do perineal urethrostomies. All right, so let's kind of break down different strictures and dis discuss how to take care of them. So we have a two centimeter stricture, um, or two centimeters or less. You, these are usually appropriate for an excision and primary anastomosis. So say this gentleman, he's got a tight stricture in the bulbar urethra. So it's, it's obviously less than um, five French. His flow, let's say, is, is three or four. So it's obviously um, slow. An excision and primary anastomosis is his best choice. So we'll make a perineal incision. We'll mobilize the bulbar urethra. We'll mobilize the bulb. We'll ex here's the scar here. We'll excise the scar. We'll spatulate both ends so that our anastomosis is not a circle. It's kind of spatulated so we don't have a, a higher risk of recurrence. And if you look at success rate with an excision and primary anastomosis, success rates are 95%, if not higher in some series. What about this gentleman? Maybe a little bit longer, two to four centimeters. Um, are we able to do that or should we consider some type of a graft? You also may want to consider vessel sparing. So this is a, the stricture is here. What we'll do is we'll mobilize the membranous urethra. We'll um, put a vessel loop and identify and um, get the bulbo urethral arteries out of the way. We'll then transect the, the urethra and excise the scar. And then we'll put our two ends back together by putting our sutures in. So if this patient's had a previous surgery or say he has hypospadias and we don't know the blood supply of the corpus spongiosa coming retrograde, this is a very good option for that patient. Again, here's a longer stricture. So you see, I bet this gentleman probably had a TUR because you see his open bladder neck and he has a long stricture here. So he's probably a, a good patient for an onlay. So again, we'll make our perineal incision. We usually make a midline. We'll identify the corpus spongiosum, we'll mobilize it. We place all of our grafts dorsally. Um, it may be a little bit easier to do ventrally, but there was a good abstract at the AUA a couple years ago, and what they looked at was about 1,000 patients, ventral versus dorsal, and the dorsal patients had a, a significant improvement compared to ventral. So. We, we have done them all dorsal in the past. I like it better because I think I can get a better spread of the graft and fix it better. And I think my success rates are better that way. So we'll do our anastomosis proximally, and then we'll start running suture up. We'll do our anastomosis distally and run suture down. Um, what about uh, maybe a stricture in the mid bulbar urethra? So the length, it's one or two centimeters you may be able to do an ex excision and primary anastomosis. But if it's greater than two centimeters, you have a higher risk of giving them cord D. What about this gentleman? This gentleman may be benefited by like an augmented anastomosis or this gentleman as well. So an augmented anastomosis is where we, again, we've mobilized the corpus spongiosum. Here's the, the tight stricture. We're gonna excise that area, but there's still stricture on both sides. So we'll spatulate the urethra on both ends. We'll lay our buccal graft down again we'll do our ventral anastomosis and then we'll sew this back together. Success rates with this actually initially are about 80 to 90%, but there is some data now coming out that's showing maybe 15 to 20 years down the road, this operation isn't as good as we thought. And we may wanna consider doing more vessel sparing. What about um, long penile urethral strictures or pan urethral stricture? So we can ad address these in either a one stage of approach or maybe a two-stage approach. Um, sometimes you can do both. 
sometimes I've done a, a, an onlay proximally and then staged distally. Um, but if you look at stage success rates, they're about 70%. Please also remember, if you have a gentleman with lichen sclerosis doing any type of genital skin, penile skin flaps or, or scrotal skin flaps, the success rates are zero. So these are things that we would not recommend in that, in that patient population. Dr. Kolkarni is actually, uh, obviously he identified the Kolkarni procedure that we all discuss. It's a dorsal graft. And if you look at his initial paper, he had 117 patients. His follow-up was very good for a reconstructive paper. It was almost five years. He had about 70 patients with lichen sclerosis, 12 that had catheter-induced um, strictures, idiopathic, and then some hypospadias. If you look at his length, it's about 14 centimeters. So they're obviously long strictures, but most of the patients never had surgery, which is kind of typical for lichen sclerosis. His success rates are about 83, 84%. So the, the patients did relatively well, better than a staged procedure, if you think of it that way. But obviously, no, no surgery is ever perfect. These are pictures from his, um, his paper. So how he does this for people who have not seen it, we make a perineal incision and he inverts the penis in through the perineum. He does a one-sided dissection, so he only mobilizes the urethra on one side. Um, you'll see in a few minutes, this is not how I do this. I'd actually do a, a bilateral dissection. In talking to Sanjay, his statement is, well, he's worried about blood supply to the urethra and the fact that if we do bilateral, we may limit the blood supply. In all honesty, we have not really had any issue with that. And I think I get a better, I can stretch the urethra a little bit better, and I, I feel more comfortable sewing the urethra that way. Here's his graft. So he's placed his graft. A lot of times you're going to have to put two grafts down. So he's got a graft, a graft here, and then you can see the second graft coming down here. And then this is his urethra that he's going to sew over top. You see he's got a very tight segment in here. But also, and I've, I've said this to Sanjay, this, this is a urethra. I'm not sure... This actually looks pretty good in my hands. I think the scar tissue is kind of down here more. But then he closes it back up and pushes the penis back into the um, in normal position. So here's our patient. So this is the patient that we did. So as you can see, he has a vo very long stricture from his meatus all the way back. And, and it actually goes all the way back to here. He had significant squamous metaplasia back this far. So, I don't make a lambda incision anymore. We make a midline, so this, he was done a while ago. And the one thing I do differently is you'll see, I make actually an incision. I do a circumcising incision. I deglove the penis and bring the penis into the perineum. What that allows me to do is it allows me to stretch the penis more. And so I feel more comfortable putting my graft on. When I did um, the Kalkarni procedure, um, I actually, um, had one patient with Cordy, and so when I started doing it this way, I've never really had a Cordy. So um, I feel more comfortable doing this this way. Um, you'll see we mobilize the urethra on both sides, so I have my urethra completely mobilized. The other advantage of this is you can see I'm able to mobilize all the way out uh, underneath the glands, and so I'm able to take the mobilization all the way out underneath the glands. Um, Again, here's my graft now, and as you can see, I can spread my native urethra, I spread fix my graft, and then I sew this on top. And so this is this patient's retrograde, or avoiding cystic urethrogram. Now, I, I'd love to just tell you this is exactly what it looked like, but I can tell you um, at two or three weeks after his surgery, he did have some extravasation, and so this was actually at four weeks after. The one thing I also want to say is a lot of these patients, if you remember what his pre-film looked like, his meatus was very tight and it was almost completely obstructed. So a lot of these patients will have to do meatal dilation. So this patient, as you can see, he's wide open here, but he did great for about four or five years. And then he started getting some meatal stenosis and we started him on his meatal dilator. And he's now over 10 years out and has done well, has not really had any recurrence. He lives about 10 hours from me, and he, he drives into Norfolk once a year for me to scope him. Um, and his urethra doesn't look normal, but it's open and patent, and his post void residuals are minimal. So he's actually done very well. What about a two-stage repair, though? What, if the, what would be the indication for us considering a two-stage repair? So it, 
in my opinion, if the penile urethra is less than eight French, I don't think there's enough native urethra to sew to. And so those patients, I would do a staged repair. Now, I don't have pictures of the first stage, but as I'm sure many people have done these, we'll do a urethrotomy. We'll then mobilize, uh, maybe excise the urethral plate. This gentleman, I left it. And then we'll harvest a buccal graft and place this down. Now, this is how we do it in Norfolk. But I can tell you that in the hotter areas, um, I know in India and I know in other places, sometimes it may be better to do a Johansson where you just do your urethrotomy, urethrotomy give them a, uh, a cutaneous urethrostomy, and then come back at a second time and do the buccal graft because leaving the buccal graft exposed to a warm and um, hot climate, sometimes it can cause some increase in scarring. So this gentleman is a gentleman who had um, lichen sclerosis. He had actually um, failed a previous um, surgery, and so we were doing a stage repair for him. So the second stage, which is usually about six months later, we're gonna make incisions along the edges. As you can see, the important part is to make sure the meatus is open. So I usually scope them before we do anything or at least calibrate with a bougie. We're gonna mark where our graphs are. This is at least, he's probably even bigger than normal. We wanted it at least 24 French. Um, he's obviously closer to 30 French. We're gonna make sure we raise our flaps. So we're gonna mobilize the urethra. This will be now a flap, but we're gonna raise our skin flaps and be very careful to make sure we protect the blood supply to our buccal grafts. I, I place a sound in the urethra. This is a 24 French sound that I'll place in. And then we'll, I try to start with the meatus and proximally, and then we'll run this up. And one of the important aspects of doing a um, staged repair especially if it's a patient with hypospadias, there's a high risk of a, um, there's a high risk of um, fistula. And therefore, we'll do a, a flap over top. So we did a Dartos flap, or, um, mobilize this, and then place that on top of our, our reconstruction. When we did not do flaps, we had about a 25% fistula rate. When we started doing flaps, the fistula rate it's not zero, but it's pretty close. We've just had one or two. And then this is his long-term outcome. And as I said earlier, success rate in this group is about 70 to 75%. Uh, percent. Um, it's not as high as we initially thought. When uh, we started talking about stage repairs years ago, we would tell patients that the st success rate is actually 85%, but actually looking at these patients long-term, the success rates are 70%. Also, what about a long, tight stricture? So this is something that we're seeing more and more of. This is a patient of mine. Now, he had a urolum, which we no longer have, but he had a long history of stricture disease. And here is his retrograde urethrogram. There's the urolum in place. And so we offered him, but this could also be used for a patient like this with a very long, tight stricture that maybe you can't excise, and there's no way to augment that. So we place a ventral dorsal graft. Some people call these kissing grafts. Um, other options, you could do a tubularized graft, but the success rate with that is almost zero. You could do a tubularized penile flap, but success rates are less than 50%. And obviously, genital skin um, could be used, but again, if they have lichen sclerosis, it's really a bad idea to do that. So Joel Gelman, who was one of our fellows in Norfolk, was the first to publish this. So as you can see, he's got a long stricture here in this area. So he's mobilized the urethra. He's done a urethrotomy. And now he's excised this stricture. So he, but he's left the sponge. So he's, he's excised the mucosa off of the stricture. So this is not a traumatic stricture like a ball bar um, straddle injury because obviously the sponge is all, all gone. But he's excised the mucosa off. He's then harvested his buccal graft. He's placed the buccal graft on the corpus spongiosum, so it acts as a, it's a flap. It's a graft and a flap, if you think about it. He places a buccal graft dorsally, and then he sews things together. And when he looked at his initial results, he did 18 patients, and 17 of them were cured. Um, he had a follow-up of over four years, which is really good, and he had really no significant complications. So let's go back. This is our patient. 
So this is his urolume. And the urolume completely obliterates the whole urethra. So as you can see, there's actually no lumen here. So what we did was we excised the earloom off of the sponge. Here's our sponge. I did have to transect it. Here's our sponge. We took our buccal graft, and as you can see, we laid our buccal graft here and our buccal graft on our sponge, and then we sewed it back together. I can tell you for eight years, he did very well. He was um, in his late 70s when I met him, and, and uh, he lived about eight hours away in, in New York where he would come down in the winter and during snow. and after the eighth year, I asked him not to come anymore because he was in his mid 80s and him driving probably wasn't a great idea. But he did well for at least eight years. I'm assuming he's no, no longer here because this operation was probably about 10 or 15 years ago. Finally, we can't forget perineal urethrostomies. Um, this is a gentleman who's had numerous reconstructions as well as he's had a number of internal urethrotomies. And I know all of us as surgeons, and especially us reconstructive surgeons, we think we can fix anything, and we think we should always you know, try to fix things, but sometimes they're not repairable. And so sometimes we just need to understand that maybe doing a um, perineal urethrostomy is the better out outcome for our patients. So this, this gentleman was, as I said, is, um, although he's only 60 years old, he's had a number of reconstructions, flaps, and grafts. Um, the options are he could do intermittent catheterization, he could balloon dilate himself, he could do a staged reconstruction, but success rates are pretty poor, especially perineally. We could try a single reconstruction like I call Carney, but I'm not sure I'd be any better than the other previous uh, three surgeons who operated on him. Or we could do a perineal urethrostomy. So here's his, we mobilized for a perineal urethrostomy, but if you see his, we did a urethrotomy, but the urethra is all squamous metaplasia. So in these patients, we actually take a buccal graft and we'll place it dorsally and then close our edges together. It looks a little bit, I, I don't love the look of this because I, I would like this to be a little bit spread more, but I can tell you that this gentleman, um, four or five years afterwards, he was still doing well and, and having no issues. So it's just to make sure that we don't forget a perineal urethrostomy because it is something that we should consider. Again, success rates are not perfect though. And sometimes you'll need a buccal graft and some people have described using a perineal flap. Um, uh, there's a gentleman in Australia who described using what he calls the lotus flap where he mobilizes urethra, tubularizes, mobilizes perineal skin, kind of almost like a single pore flap, tubularizes it and bring it into the urethra. So I know many people know about IVU, but uh, I'm going to give us a little shout out. It's an organization that's committed to making quality urologic care available to people worldwide. Um, we provide medical and surgical education to physicians, nurses. It was started by a wonderful human being called Catherine DeVries. Um, this is our 25th year. We were hoping to have a big celebration. COVID uh, obviously stopped our celebration this year, but I, I promised our 26th year will be our uh, anniversary year now and we'll uh, hopefully do some celebrating then. But so people who know us, um, you know, we, we try to help, help you, help our partners, um, and, and help develop training centers. Um, we want to build centers of excellence. And truly, I think we've moved in to try to develop, um, help develop the next leaders of urology outside of, you know, in, the, um, in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, the Caribbean. We're really trying to do some research. And we're trying to do mentoring and really trying to do everything we can to, to help you be the leaders of your, the people below you so that um, you don't need us anymore. Um, we do on-site workshops. Um, we, the patients are your patients, they're not ours. So obviously we'll do some cases, but, but most of the cases we try to make you do the surgery um, with us helping. We have visiting professors, we're starting to do these telehealth, these virtual visiting professors. We do have some scholarships um, right now. Obviously, nothing's happening, but we do have some finances for a pediatric scholarship um, that we can help somebody who's interested in doing pediatrics. Again, our goal is to build your local capacity, but we need to know, so anybody here who's interested, you know, reach out to tell us what we need. We wanna hear what we can do for you, we don't want to show up and say, this is what you need. That sounds like the President of the United States now. I don't, we don't want to be like that. Um, most Americans are not like him. 
we want to show up and we want to you know listen to what what what's the needs in your local area and then provide the right physician and the long-term follow-up and solutions here's obviously a number of our regional centers we're actually developing many more and we have collaborations with the AUA in industry and obviously the most important thing is we're sustainable we're going we've been here for 25 years and we'll be here 25 years from now and, and we'll continue to support you and, and be with you and I'll tell you, I tell most of my uh, friends here in the United States, I, my real friends are in Africa, probably because if, if they're around me long enough, no one here likes me that much, but I can come in for a week and people will still think I'm nice and then I can leave. So um, this is kind of our model. So uh, this is from pediatrics, but um, what we'd like to do is come in a visit site. So this, unfortunately, this uh, COVID crisis really kind of um, slowed some things down. I was going to Ethiopia, Cameroon, in Benin, which were three places we haven't been, truly been, to explore, to try to build new sites. I was in uh, Ecuador earlier in the year, and we're trying to find new places to go. Then over the next three to five years, we'll help build your capacity, and then we want you to be the teachers. You know, we'll continue our relationships with you. We won't leave. We want you to be the teachers um, in doing more advanced cases and doing the outreach. 2005, we did six workshops. A couple years ago, we did 30. Unfortunately, this year, obviously, we're only going to be doing a few because of the current crisis. But once we're back and able to travel, I know um, that we're all very interested in traveling more. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them now. I think I, I was about right, Mohammed. I said I'd be done uh, in about 40, 45 minutes. Um, but actually, so I guess I jumped ahead. So I'll finish and then I'll take questions. So for ball bar strictures, I think you should consider an excision in primary anastomosis if it's short. Um, two centimeters or less. If it's longer and closer to the sphincter, you can go a little bit longer, and I've done up to four centimeters. If not, you should be able to do uh, onlay or an augmented anastomosis, you know, urethral strictures, single or stage repairs, and obviously don't forget a perineal arthrostomy because we all hope our patients are, uh, are avoiding uh, like this for a long time after we're done. Um, the other thing to consider when you're going in and doing this is make sure you have a plan, but you've got to be adaptable. There are times when I've gotten in there and I was like, oh, this isn't going to work. I've got to go get a graft or I've got to do something different. So make sure you have the capacity to do those. Always have an escape plan that you can get out. And then finally, thanks to everybody on the call. Um, <laughs> there's some fun pictures from Dakar from your deck a number of years ago. And this is from Pauza in Zimbabwe. So I, um, I hope we have Pausa next year, and I hope to be able to join everybody there. Um, so now I think it's time for questions. Um, Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, we, we have some questions from the floor, and, and we, I will ask a first set, and while you're answering, we'll have a, a second set. There was a question uh, about bladder neck contracture after uh, a traffic uh, a traffic accident so do you consider those as a urethral stricture and in those case do you do urethroplasty or dviu i know it's not exactly the topic but i think you can get it. so yeah, of course il y, a, il y avait une question concernant les um, les, les, les contractures du col vésical après accident de la voie publique uh, est-ce que c'est considéré comme une sinus de l'urètre ou bien est-ce que c'est considéré, est-ce qu'ils vont réaliser une rétroplastie Perfect. So, the second question is, uh, that's, that's my question, and, and I know you mentioned the Kulkarni technique. So, is it always necessary to fix the buccal mucosa graft to the corpus cavernosum or can you sew it right away? And there is one last question. In case of a very narrow urethral plate, do you do use the combination of graft, dorsal or ventral? Uh, is it going to be dorsal and, uh, and ventral at the same time? So, donc, il y a deux autres questions. L'une, c'est dans la technique de Kulkarni, quand on fait un lambo gigal sur toute l'étendue de l'urethre pénien, est-ce qu'il est nécessaire de fixer le lambo au corps caverne ou est-ce qu'on peut faire la suite directement? Une autre question, dans le cas où la plaque urétrale est très serrée, c'est-à-dire qu'elle est très petite, est-ce qu'ils utilisent une combinaison de, 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 de lambeaux Dans ce cas, est-ce qu'ils vont être dorsal ou ventral so, Ok, to you, Kurt. Ok, thanks Mohamed. 
So going to the first question, um, I guess it depends. So it's pretty unusual, as, as you know, for a motor vehicle accident to cause a bladder neck stricture. Um, most of the motor vehicle accidents with pelvic fractures will lead to a um, membrane cerebral injury. And so for those patients, um, I would do for sure an excision and primary anastomosis urethral reconstruction. If you look at the data, an endoscopic procedure rarely work for pelvic fracture urethral injuries. And the reason they don't work is there's no blood supply. Is, is anybody who's ever done a pelvic fracture urethral injury, that's a plate of scar there. And if you're going to do a uh, endoscopy procedure, you need good blood to allow everything to heal and, and allow the mucosa to come back. So success rates with endoscopic procedures on traumatic strictures are close to zero. Now, there are patients who will develop bladder neck obliteration from an injury. And I just recently had a patient um, who was referred to me from Baltimore, who his, his, most of his prosthetic urethra was gone from his pelvic fracture. Now, unfortunately for those patients, you, if you want to repair them, you probably need to do a pubectomy, or a, a prostatectomy, sorry. You may need to do a pubectomy to see, but you probably need to do a prostatectomy because there's probably no great treatment option for him. Um, this was a younger gentleman, and actually we did a uh, continent catheterizable stoma, and so he actually now catheterizes himself because I thought doing a prostatectomy increases his risk for, til for fertility, increases his erectile dysfunction issues. Um, and so I, I felt I, he was better off with us doing a kind of catheterizable stoma. But you can do a um, repair if you want, but you have to do a prostatectomy. Finally, just to finish off on that kind of question um, line, we, we see a lot of patients with strictures after open prostatectomies and or, you know, retro, radical prostatectomies. Initially, we would try endoscopic repairs. And so I would do endoscopic repairs. I would probably inject steroids. I do inject mitomycin. And the success rates are variable. Um, if that doesn't work, I do offer them an excision and primary anastomosis. You will have to do a pubectomy in that group. And they'll be totally incontinent usually. And so it's a difficult operation to do. They're incontinent afterwards. You have to put a sphincter. And so if you don't have the option for them to have a sphincter, then I would be very, I would be very hesitant and I would talk to them about an SP tube or a cotton catheterizable stoma. With regards to the question on the, um, do I sew the buckle grafts to the, the um, corp corporal bodies for sure? I think they need to be fixed. Um, I think you need to have it fixed there. If you think about how a graft takes, it initially takes by osmosis for the first 24 to 36 hours, and then it develops its own blood supply. And if it's not fixed, you're going to develop a hematoma, a seroma. That's going to decrease your graft take. So I fix, I fix my grafts on the sides. I pie crust them by making small incisions through them, and then I fix them in the middle of the decrease the risk of, of or increase the, the graft take. And then finally, on someone who has a really um, narrow, tight stricture, um, I think if, if the stricture is less than five to eight French, I'll excise the urethral plate, and then I will put down a graft dorsally and a graft ventrally on the sponge, kind of as I show. So hopefully I answered um, those questions. I see another question now uh, about erectile dysfunction after a call carny. And actually, I think it's similar. Um, I've not done a good job of collecting patient questionnaires because obviously that's the best way to do that. But um, I really don't off the top of my head remember somebody who has had significant ED So I, from this. I, obviously, erectile dysfunction happens no matter what operations we do in the urethra. So erectile dysfunction is somewhere between 4 and 10% in general. And I don't think it's any higher with the way we modify the, our uh, colcarnic procedure. Um, there's a question I think about, do you think the post-op care, um, maybe, yeah, um, obviously, so the good question is, so I, I'm assuming what you're asking is if you do a, um, if you, if you do intermittent catheterization after a DVIU, will that keep it open more? And yes, for sure it will. Um, but again, as most of, as you know, 
you, you start with a 16 French catheter and then they're down to a 14 and then they're down to a 12 and then they're trying to attend and you're doing your IU again. So I think it keeps it open longer, but I don't think it cures the patient. Um, also, I have done the ASOPA technique in the penile urethra. Um, I actually feel more comfortable mobilizing the urethra. My concern with ASOPA is I, I don't feel like I'm able to lift the urethra as much because as you know, you're going through the, the ventral, opening it, and then incising where that stricture is. I would much rather roll the urethra off, excise, and then I think I can spread the, the graft better and I can spread the urethra on top of it better. It's a little bit longer to do, but I think it makes it a little bit, I think my, the outcomes are probably better, but I'm not gonna tell you I have any data to, sh to prove that. So um, I would do whatever you're comfortable with, but I like to make sure my graft is spread as wide as I can. Any other questions? Any, any other question from the floor? We have some a few more minutes left. Uh, hey, yes, Mohammed, I have one question. Professor Madina. Go. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. It was a very yeah. nice presentation. I really appreciate it. And of um, course. I just want to ask one question about the panurator structure you present. Yeah. When the when the meatus is involved and very tight, how do you deal with this part? So um, I will. So we initially dissect up parent, you know, from below. But then once we get to the top, we'll actually make an incision into the meatus and do a, a meatotomy and actually go into it almost into the gland, well, into the glands, and we'll sew our graft onto the glands. Um, distally and then bring it down. But I, I warn all my patients that there is a risk of developing a meatal stricture. I think that's probably the highest risk of um, recurrence. And so I warn them they may have to do a small little dilator to keep that open over time. Um, but <laughs> hopefully that, it's hard to explain, but yeah, I, I, I do a big meatotomy and then lay my graft in. Um, I, I kind of pull it up from below and lay my graft in there and sew it in place. Hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> Thank you. Right, well, any other question? So I would like to join Dr. Madina to thank you really for the nice presentation and for having the idea of this visiting professor and initiating it yourself. And for the floor, this is the first session. We'll reach out to you very soon to give you the next uh, session, probably in a week or two. It depends on how things are evolving. But that's something we would like to keep, even when, uh, um, when uh, COVID-19 has gone away, which is something we all wish. Donc, uh, je disais que nous remercions Dr. Kurt pour sa brillante présentation, mais surtout pour avoir eu l'idée de ce visiting professeur et de l'avoir lui-même démarré. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'on va continuer. On va s'approcher de vous rapidement pour, euh, pour, euh, pour vous donner la prochaine présentation. Et, euh, et nous espérons que ça va se continuer, même au-delà du COVID-19, que nous espérons euh, nous quitter rapidement. Donc, euh, voilà, s'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, je pense que nous sommes arrivés à la fin. Et nous allons demander à Dr. Kurt de, nous, de partager la présentation. Et pour ce faire, nous vous demanderons d'envoyer... Euh, votre adresse email, je vous envoie tout de suite euh, euh, l'adresse de la pausa que vous pouvez utiliser euh, pour envoyer vos adresses email pour ceux pour lesquels on n'a pas l'adresse email. Ça nous permettra de partager la présentation. Ouais. Hey Mohamed, can I just say, I didn't yeah. understand what you just said, but can I say just two things? Yeah, we're just uh, asking that you share the slides and that we'll share it with everybody. I was just going to say I'm happy to share the slides. <laughs> wow, so maybe I am learning French. Um, and then the other thing is, I mentioned a rug study. We talked about this at Pausa last year. Um, once we're through this COVID crisis, I have one of our junior residents who's going to start it here. Um, so we're going to look at retrograde urethrograms done by our radiologist and then compare them to what I, the ones I do um, and see if they're adequate. I would love to develop a number of centers. I got an email a couple weeks ago from a, a PAUSA member who wants to be start with this. So I truly am, um, I would love to get more people to reach out. And if anybody has any questions, you all have my email. 
you're more than welcome to WhatsApp me anytime or email me about questions about anything. But I would love to do a multi-center trial looking at retrogrades and making them better for all of our patients. So, all right, that was yeah. it. Yeah, to, add on that, to add on that, two more things. So <laughs> we've been having ideas about how to manage urethral stricture across Africa. I think with this group and the others who haven't been uh, able to attend, we have to start circulating documents that we can use. The second thing is that I see uh, the princess, uh, Dr. Jean McDonald's, and I, I'm sure she will be happy to do a presentation soon. And there are a lot of things that we can, we can talk about, especially in prostatic biopsy, perineal prostatic biopsy, etc. Do you want to say a word? Um, just, it, it's been very interesting, of course, because we're all sequestered in our home. We was able to listen to Kurt's presentation. So thanks, COVID, for that. But anyhow, <laughs> I hope you all are keeping safe and, as you know, following everything that's going on. Yeah. Thanks Thank again for the presentation. Jean, it's, great, it's great seeing you, Jean. I'm glad you're doing well and healthy. I, I'm assuming you took care of your prime minister when he was in the hospital. Did you put his catheter Definitely. in? <laughs> I can't say anything on the grounds that it might incriminate me. <laughs> Love it Muhammad, to all the good yeah. <laughs> Muhammad, one last thing to think about. Um, and sorry, everyone, when we're talking, I think of another idea. We could develop a WhatsApp group, and people could start, you could submit questions and, and discuss strictures or management of, of different. Um, different conditions if you wanted. That may be another way of, of trying to connect people during this time. And I would encourage people to send an email to the uh, uh, PAUSA email that I sent so that we can have a uh, keep track of the emails and uh, phone numbers to, to start working on all this. Just to remind you, there are so many opportunities of collaboration between us with the partners we have, and we have won, I think, et pour ceux qui ne sont pas euh, encore membres dans l'audience, c'est l'occasion d'être membre de la Pauza. Et je pense que nous commençons euh, une initiative qui va nous permettre d'aller beaucoup plus loin. Donc, again, I would like to encourage, encourage all the people here to join Pauza for those who haven't yet. I know there are residents and many other people. There are a lot of enormous numbers of, of collaboration that we can do among us and with our partners, with our colleagues. And, and to remind you that uh, uh, Kurt and Jean, they are both African, they are PAUSA members. So, donc, nous encourageons à nous joindre. Donc, do you have another word to say, Kurt? No, no, I'm done. I, I shared my email in WhatsApp with everybody on the chat, so. Donc, merci à tout le monde d'avoir participé. Nous allons être uh, en contact avec vous très prochainement pour la prochaine session. Et voilà, thank you for joining in and We'll be in touch for the next session that we'll do very soon. Thank you and bye-bye right. to everybody. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Kurt. Nice job. Bye. Bye. I'm we'll bringing you from Kenya. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you. This is great. Wonderful. I'm glad it worked well. Yes, Eldor, it is my next session. Good. Have a good day. Good. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dr.